So we've learned how to do inferential statistics by looking at someone's z-score and seeing if it falls in the rejection region. But that's unlikely that we're going to do a study with just one person, right? So more likely what we're going to see is we're going to have a study with multiple people and we want to see where their z-scores fall. Unfortunately, when we look at multiple people, it does change a little bit of what we have to do. And the z-score that we've just been using won't work anymore. So we have to come up with a new distribution of means to compare it to. So this lecture right now is going to be about why the distribution we were using before won't work and why we need a new different, sorry, a new distribution. So before we were looking at the normal distribution, we had a rejection region, like this one's two-tailed, and then we look and see where a score fell, and if it fell in the rejection region, then we rejected the null. Well, what happens now if we have two scores and one's in the rejection region and the other one's in a rejection region, and maybe a third score isn't in the rejection region. Or maybe we have multiple scores, and some are in the rejection region, and some aren't. Do you see how this might be more confusing? Because how do we know whether we are supposed to reject the null or not? So what we're going to do is take the mean of all these red bars and see where the mean falls. If the mean falls in the rejection region, then we'll reject the null. If it doesn't fall in the rejection region, then we won't reject the null. We'll fail to reject the null. The problem becomes that when we've done math to our scores by calculating their mean, we have inherently changed the nature of the scores. So an example would be, let's say I wanna look at our class and look at their IQ scores and compare that to another class and look at their IQ scores and see who's higher. Let's just say for fun, I decided to give 30 points to everybody in the other class. You could see how that wouldn't feel fair if I took our IQ scores as they naturally were and compared our scores to another class where I've added 30 points to everybody's score. That wouldn't be fair because if you do math to one side, you have to do the same math to the other side. And I'm, I'm using this to highlight to you that by doing math to our scores, calculating their mean, I've inherently changed the way they are. So now I'm gonna try and show that to you pictorially with a distribution. So let's say this is our distribution and I have this X here to remind ourselves. These are our X scores. There's a mu of our distribution and it has a standard deviation. And now let's say that this is our population and I'm gonna take a little baby sample from my population. If I take a baby sample from my population, you could see how I would probably not be sampling from the tails, right? More likely I'll be sampling from the middle because that's where most people are. If you want to think about it, imagine this is height, and these are people that are really, really tall. If I only sample 10 people, you can see how I wouldn't get somebody super tall like Shaquille O'Neal in my study because he's so very rare. So my little samples, if I take little samples from this blue distribution, they're going to likely be pulled from the middle of this distribution. So if I take a little sample and I create it and let's make it this purple pink color and then I do another little sample and I do another little sample and another and another and another and another and another. What I'm going to do with all those little samples is I'm going to calculate the mean for all my baby distributions. And the means for all my baby distributions, if I put them together and create another distribution, I can have a distribution of means. And so what I did here is I put this X bar to say that I took all the means from these little purpley distributions and I put them all together. So let's say this mean is 10 and this is nine and this is eight and this is 11 and this is 10 and this is 12. And I put them all in this distribution. And what I would find is that the mean for the distribution of means is going to be the same as the mean for the distribution of raw scores. So I've denoted the mean for the distribution of means as mu sub x bar, because this is the mean for the distribution of means. And so the mean for the distribution of means is the same as the mean of the distribution from which they came. But as you can even see in this picture, the standard deviation for the distribution of means, denoted as sigma sub x bar, is very much smaller than the standard deviation for the distribution of raw scores. So what I'm saying here is when I've calculated a mean for a sample, I've inherently chopped off the ends of the distribution of the population because people don't tend to sample up in the upper and lower ends of the distribution. So my samples are only coming from the middle of the distribution. And even if I do sample, let's say I do have Shaquille O'Neal in my sample, do you see how the mean 
wouldn't be near Shaquille O'Neal. The mean would be further closer to the true mean because everybody else is pulling it down. So no matter what, I'm not going to have means in my samples that represent the upper ends of these tails. So my distribution of means, and this distribution was created by all these little purpley ones, this distribution of means is going to be inherently smaller in range than the population um, scores from which it came. And so my distribution of means is different. That signifies that if I'm going to calculate a sample mean for those red bars, I have to compare that sample mean to a distribution of other means. I cannot compare that distribution of sample means to raw scores because that's like doing math to one side and not the other. So if I want to look at those red bars that I was on the other page or on the other screen for, I would have to compare them to a distribution of other means. Now, if I wanted to know the distribution of other means, what it looked like, I could pretty much use the mean of the blue population because you see how the means are going to be the same. But it's the standard deviation for the distribution of means that is very, very much different. Now, I could go and take, uh, let's say, my normal population and sample 100 people, or sorry, 100 samples, and make a distribution of means so that I could find out what the standard deviation for the distribution of means would be. But someone discovered a long time ago that the um, standard deviation for the distribution of means can be calculated without having to do all of this work. So now I can guess what this distribution looks like and I can make my distribution of means based on these two parameters with just a simple math um, computation. So the characteristics of the sampling distribution of means is that the mean for the sampling distribution of means is the mean. So I, I, you will hear me say frequently throughout this course, the mean is the mean is the mean. The mean is never the problem. The mean always ends up being similar to the mean of the population. So if I have the mean, if I have mu, I have mu sub x bar. So we're, we're okay using any guesses for the mean uh, to represent our distribution of means. But it's that standard deviation for the distribution of means that is the problem. And someone once figured out that if we take um, the standard deviation that we already know and divide it by the square root of n. Now remember the square root of n, sorry, n is our sample size. So if I take the standard deviation that I already know, divide it by the square root of n, that will give me the standard deviation for the distribution of means. So rather than taking 100 samples so that I can plot them and figure out what my standard deviation for the distribution of means is, all I need is the knowledge I already have which is the standard deviation, and divide it by my sample size, sorry, the square root of my sample size, and I'll have everything I need to create my sampling distribution of means. Once I have my sampling distribution of means, I can recreate that picture with my rejection regions and calculate the mean for my red bars and figure out if they're in the rejection region. Now, I, I do want you to understand that the shape of the distribution of means is going to be, um, normal under certain circumstances. So first of all, if the data that it comes from is normally distributed, then the shape of the distribution will be normal. So if it's normal, it will continue to be normally distributed. And remember, all those things we learned about the normal distribution were very critical for inferential statistics. But here is something special. Let's say it's a skewed distribution. If it's a skewed distribution, we will still have a normal distribution for the sampling distribution of means as long as the sample size is over 30. Now I'm gonna show you this in a second, but I wanted to tell you what this was called because I'm gonna give you a proof of the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem is saying that the sampling distribution of means tend toward a normal shape as the sample size increases, regardless of the shape of the population distribution from which the samples have randomly been selected. So I'm gonna reread this after I show you the proof of my um, central limit theorem. I wanted to show you um, a drawing that we made together because I feel like this becomes clear when we draw it together. So let's say that I have a normal, oh, sorry, I have a distribution that's um, positively skewed. So um, this could be housing prices, right? And so um, we have some scores up here that make it positively skewed 
and it isn't it is not normally distributed which means inherently I can't run inferential statistics on it just like this but let's say we do the idea of creating the sampling distribution of means where I take a little baby sample hold on I want my baby sample to look a lot like my mama sample all right so I take a little baby sample and another little baby sample and another little baby sample and another little baby sample let's say for the mom population uh, that the the mean around here is, uh, let's say, 30. I don't know what this would be for. But then let's say that this, this distribution here has a mean of 25. This one has a mean of 32. This one has a mean of 35. This one has a mean of 20. See how they all kind of cluster around the same mean location? Even though this distribution here is skewed, the baby distributions are going to have means around the true mean of this distribution. So if I take all those baby means and plot them into a distribution, I'm going to have the distribution of means the clusters right around 30. So my distribution of means, some are going to be above the 30, some are going to be below the 30, but the distribution of means is going to be normally distributed as long as I measure over 30 people. If I measure under 30 people, let me just do that in red here, you could see how my little baby distributions might not capture the entire distribution. So if I have only five people, it might just capture the, the top part of the distribution, but the tail, with only five people, I haven't captured really anything in the tail to have it be appropriately sized. So the mean there would be maybe too low, maybe around 15. When I have over 30 people, at least one person in my little baby sample is going to end up in the upper tail, causing it to be normally distributed. So as long as I have 30 people, I'm going to have these tails in my little baby distributions that force the mean upward so that it is more aligned with the mean of the population from which it came. So if I have under 30 people, my little means are going to be around this area and are not going to appropriately represent the distribution. But as long as I have at least 30 people in my study, then I can see that all of the means for my distributions, my little baby samples, are going to make a distribution of means that clusters, uh, that floats around 30 and is normally distributed. So then now that we've seen that drawn this way, where we had a positive skew, and yet the distribution that came from the distribution of little sample means was still normally distributed. Let's reread this central limit theorem and see if it makes sense. The sampling distribution of means that was at the bottom of the page, that's where we have all the means co come together and make a distribution. So the sampling distribution of means tend toward a normal shape. That means they tend to be normally distributed as the sample size increases regardless of the shape of the population distribution from which the samples have been selected. This means that it will, the distribution of means will be normally distributed regardless if it's a positive skew originally. That's pretty cool because that means if we had data that were positively skewed before, we couldn't run inferential statistics on them, but now as long as we sample over 30 people, we can now use the central limit theorem and the distribution of means will be um, normally distributed and we can run inferential statistics on it. So now that we have this new sampling distribution of means, all we have to do is apply that to our six steps. And you'll remember in our six steps, um, our calculation of the z-score was step four. And that's gonna be the, really the only thing that changes when we do setting up our research question, our null hypothesis, our rejection regions, all of those are gonna stay the same, except now we're just going to calculate a z-score with a new set of parameters. So this is our new z-score, and it's going to be x-bar. It's no longer x, because now we have a set of x-scores. So it's gonna be x-bar minus mu divided by the standard deviation for the distribution of means. Now, to make this easier for us to compute, this ultimately is going to be the calculation that we do, because this in the denominator here is the standard deviation for the distribution of means. So, Ultimately, this is going to be our z-score calculation. It is going to be x bar minus mu divided by standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And so what I want to point out before I end is that really moving forward, almost all of the tests I give you are going to follow the same format. They're always going to be what did you get 
from your sample minus what you thought you'd get from the population divided by the standard deviation of whatever it is you are sampling. Because we're always going to be running samples, we're always going to be dividing by the square root of n. But it's always what did we get minus what we thought we get divided by the standard deviation of whatever it is we're looking at. So this is our new z-score calculation for step four. All the other steps stay exactly the same. And we're just going to have a slightly altered Z score. We put it in the picture, see if it's in the rejection region, and then either reject or fail to reject the null and make our ultimate conclusion.